Most human beings are living in urban or suburban areas, and the air they breathe is often far from being healthy. Air pollution is related to the chemicals that are injected directly into the atmosphere, which we call primary pollution. Anthropic emissions are those that are generally originating from human activities in urban environments such as transportation, industries or residential activities. The harmful chemicals primarily injected do not remain unchanged during their transport in the atmosphere. Complex chemistry takes place. We used to think that this led to a so-called self-cleansing mechanism within the atmosphere, but we now know that the new chemicals formed during these transformations can be even more toxic. We call them secondary pollutants. Among them, famous compounds such as ozone or fine particulate matter are formed, as well as compounds more complex such as peroxyacetyl nitrate that is toxic for plants, formaldehyde, or nitroaromatic compounds that are carcinogenic. Because it takes several hours or days to develop these secondary pollutants, plumes can cover areas of thousands of square kilometers. While the air pollution precursors are locally emitted, they can have effects at very large scales and can be detected even from space. In populated areas, nitrogen oxides such as NO and NO2 are emitted together with volatile organic species that are given off from solvent use, car emissions, from unburnt species, or even from vegetation. When traveling in the atmosphere, these volatile organic compounds are attacked by atmospheric free radicals, such as the OH radical. This reaction initiates a very complex chemistry that forms a whole series of very reactive radicals that are in extremely small concentrations. One of the key effects of this chemistry is that some of these radicals turn NO, nitrogen monoxide, into NO2, nitrogen dioxide. In the presence of sunlight, NO2 is then converted back into NO via photolysis, but also gives birth to one molecule of ozone, O3. This cycle not only produces an ozone molecule, but also allows the oxidation process to continue. It leads to the production of more stable molecules, including oxidized organic species. These new types of molecules are called secondary organic species, and they have their own properties, their own reactivity, and own toxicity, which is often worse than that of the primary molecule. Together with these secondary species, the cycle continues by forming an HO2 radical that will form a second ozone molecule, also by interconverting NO into NO2, and, which is very important for the efficiency of the process, will generate OH so that the process can continue to cycle again and oxidize another primary molecule. Furthermore, volatile oxidized species can in turn be attacked by radicals. And while being the products of the oxidation cycles, they themselves become the fuel of this cycle, forming even more oxidized species and even more ozone. Atmospheric organic matter is hence undergoing a progressive oxidation until it is ultimately fully oxidized. Most of the organic species end up in the form of carbon dioxide. But during the course of the oxidation, some of the secondary oxidized compounds become so poorly volatile that they condense into fine particles and form the so-called secondary organic aerosol. This is why during summer smog events, the level of fine particulate matter are often very intense. This is a very schematic description of the chemistry of the photochemical smog. In reality, hundreds of thousands of reactions involving tens of thousands of different species are occurring in any given region. The rate of these oxidation processes, their extent, the amount of ozone and particulate matter, and the chemical nature of all of the secondary pollutants are different for each precursor. And to be able to forecast the secondary atmospheric pollution, we desperately need quantitative information about each of them. To do so, atmospheric chemists use very large installations where they can reproduce a well-controlled atmosphere and study the transformation of the pollutants without being disturbed by the continuous change of the weather, of emissions, and the dispersion of the air masses. Today we will follow one of these experiments, conducted in an indoor simulation chamber. In the chamber, the condition of pressure and humidity of the atmosphere are reproduced under extremely clean conditions. Today, we focus on xylene, a well-known component of solvent and gasoline that is also emitted by unburnt car emissions. A known pressure of diluted gaseous xylene is prepared in a glass bulb of a known volume. 
This volume is flushed in the chamber through inert Teflon tubing so that a precise quantity of xylene is injected in the chamber. Then, a small volume of nitrogen dioxide, a compound emitted by most of the combustion processes, including car emissions, is injected with a gas-tight syringe. Inside the chamber, the mixture is left to equilibrate. Then the lights are turned on. These lamps are not only very powerful, but reproduce very well the irradiation spectrum of the sun in the visible and the ultraviolet range that is key for atmospheric chemistry. As soon as the lights are on, the photooxidation cycle begins. Xylene, our primary species, starts to decrease right away, and the ozone starts accumulating quickly, evidence that secondary pollutants are being formed. The chemistry takes hours to fully oxidize the primary pollutants, a time during which the group takes care of monitoring the instruments. At a certain point, when all the nitrogen oxides have been completely reacted by side reactions, we decide to inject a second dose of NOx. As soon as the reactive nitrogen oxides are available again, the decay of xylene and the accumulation of ozone resumes. Ozone is now far above the air quality standards. A tenth of secondary organic species that are formed during these processes cannot be shown here, but at some point, when almost all of the xylene has reacted, and when the secondary products begin to get oxidized too, the particulate mass starts growing until it reaches 12 micrograms per cubic meter. Some secondary species have turned into low volatility organics, and it has formed, in addition to ozone, some secondary organic aerosol, the so-called fine particles that poison our air during smog events. Finally, in addition to the whole set of online measurements, this reacting mixture is collected on filters for further molecular analysis, which allows us to understand the precise mechanisms that have led to these transformations illustrated today, and to later model them with computational methods.